Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, first I'd like to thank you for uh, watching and listening. This is the first time I've ever done anything like this, so if I appear a little awkward, I hope you'll uh, forgive me. And since I've written uh, notes for this, um, I shall be uh, looking away uh, some of the time, and um, I hope uh, it doesn't make me look too shifty. I'm not shifty, I'm looking at my notes. And uh, it's very unusual for me to address an audience like this. Normally I can see people who are falling asleep in the front row and uh, take that as a warning, but on this occasion I can't. Anyway, uh, crime and punishment, of course, is a, uh, is a subject of uh, eternal interest insofar as anything uh, human is eternal. Uh, and the great French uh, sociologist uh, Durkheim uh, thought uh, uh, that crime and criminals performed a useful social function, actually, uh, because they united the rest of society against them. And some kind of unity is essential for, uh, uh, for uh, a any society. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this view even if correct, doesn't quite tell us uh, how many uh, criminals are necessary to perform this function. And my view is uh, that we have more than a sufficiency of them uh, to do this. Of course, both the concepts of crime and punishment are happy hunting grounds uh, for philosophers, of whom I am not one. Uh, for example, uh, crime is not a natural uh, category, as say is a species of insect. Um, so uh, what is criminal in one country may not be uh, criminal in another. An obvious example is the age of consent to sexual relations, which vary from country uh, to country. So what is a crime in one, what an act that is a crime in one country is not necessarily a crime in another, and is perfectly legal in fact. Note, however, that few people would deny uh, that there should be an age of consent. There must be an age of consent to sexual relations. And uh, the fact is that uh, most uh, societies do not permit you uh, to hit a passerby uh, and take his possessions. Uh, so, in fact, for, for many things, we know perfectly well what crime is. It's, uh, and uh, I don't propose to go uh, any further in uh, refutation of the radical scepticism that one sometimes uh, meets on this question. And of course the, uh, the concept of punishment has likewise been the uh, object of a great deal of uh, philosophical uh, scepticism. Philosophical attacks on uh, punishment as a practice have been uh, very frequent. Uh, but I do not think that any society, at least no society known to me, has been able quite to do without it, whatever philosophers say. Uh, the philosophers may deny that uh, punishment serves any of its supposed functions, uh, such as deterrence, reform, or protection of the public. And, and as to retribution or the expression of social disapproval of the perpetrators, uh, there has are often been said to be, uh, it has often been said to be discreditable. Um, retribution is merely nasty, and those who believe in it should be, um, well, I won't say punished, uh, but at least reprehended, uh, so that uh, they should be uh, actually persuaded that their view is wrong and uh, primitive. Well, I've observed as a matter of empirical fact that people, penological extreme liberals, who believe that there should be no such response to crime as punishment, uh, or that punishment should be uh, lenient and resemble a kind of rectification of the, uh, of the soul or uh, moral physiotherapy, uh, usually retain in their hearts one particular crime, be it rape or child abuse or fraud, that should be harshly repressed by what can only be called punishment. Uh, in those cases, no one doubts the necessity of punishment. Therefore, punishment uh, is like nature, though you throw it out with a pitchfork, yet it will return, in this case, to the human mind. 
One of the philosophical currents that seems opposed to, to the notion of punishment is uh, determinism. There are different types of determinism, of course, that which is merely metaphysical and starts from the premise that since everything is caused, there is no such thing as freedom of will. And if there is no freedom of will, there can be no such thing as uh, guilt or desert. Uh, and therefore, uh, punishment uh, uh, is uh, unjustified. And there is, of course, also economic, sociological, psychological, neuropsychiatric uh, determinism, each of which claims completely, uh, or at least satisfactorily, uh, to explain man's behaviour to himself. Uh, they all point to the same conclusion as the metaphysical variety of determinism, namely that there is no justification uh, for punishment of crime or indeed of anything else. It seems to me, however, that such determinism, if thoroughgoing, as it needs to be if it is of philosophical interest, or in, if it's going to be philosophically compelling in any way, uh, leaves everything as it was, because those who punish are a subject to determinism or determination, uh, deterministic forces, as are uh, the punished. If he, if someone uh, sentences the criminal, or uh, rather the person who comes before the court, because of criminality does actually imply um, imply freedom of will in most legal. Uh, systems, because if there's no intent to commit a crime, there is no crime in most cases. Uh, if uh, if the person uh, the person sentencing uh, decides, for example, that the criminal should be hanged, drawn, and quartered, he is as much determined uh, as is the criminal. Uh, I am not a metaphysician. Uh, but I don't think uh, there is anyone who's actually able uh, to think of himself in this way, even uh, when uh, special pleading on his own behalf. No one actually believes that he is determined in the way uh, I've just described. Even the most determined, uh, determined determinist, if I may so put it, makes an exception in his own case and usually uh, for, his, uh, for his parents also, because most people uh, do not fail to blame their parents for things that they didn't like uh, during their childhood. He experiences choice every hour of his working life, if not, oh, with his waking life, I should say, if not more frequently than that. He therefore implicitly divides humanity into two, those who can't help they do, and himself. He is in a completely different category. Uh, for him, uh, he is an object. For himself, he is a, he's a subject, uh, but everyone else is an object, a determined object. Now, of course, I haven't actually met anyone who is really like this. Uh, most people divide humanity more subtly than, than this. That is to say, into the kind of person person who can be held responsible for his actions and the kind of person who cannot. Uh, generally speaking, uh, such people pride themselves on their generosity of spirit in a way that they uh, divide humanity. And of course, in certain circumstances, they are right to do so. Perhaps I can illustrate uh, what I mean uh, by a simple uh, clinical case. A very old man in the hospital in which I used to work uh, became confused and paranoid. And uh, in his fear of imaginary enemies, he pushed a, a very heavy um, meal trolley down the ward and in so doing injured someone quite badly. Um, now, it was discovered that there was a derangement in his biochemistry. Incidentally, he had never done anything like this before in his life. It was discovered that there was something wrong, uh, or there was a derangement in his biochemistry, in the, the blood chemicals, uh, which had caused him to become uh, confused and paranoid. Now, of course, there is no final explanation of anything uh, unless you believe in the infinite regress that is an argument for the existence of God. And there must have been, of course, a cause 
of his disordered blood chemistry. But for most explanatory purposes, uh, this derangement was uh, sufficient. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.